Hello, 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 hello. How's everybody doing? Everybody good? All right. So who's who's excited? Who came to this stream today to see some new ZBrush stuff? Anybody? Anybody? All right. So give me a shout out if you can hear me and see myself in my beautiful, luxurious, empty conference room here with fast internet. Um, so today we got a bunch of cool stuff we're going to show you all. Um, and uh, some great and new exciting things for this preview. It's gonna be a sneak preview of ZBrush 2021. So to start off, um, I just wanna hit on a few things here. So first of all, as you can see in the screen here, I have a special guest with me today. So since you all were enjoying the ZBrush Master Series that we've been doing, uh, we decided to reach out to Michael Pavlovich and see if he wanted to come out and do the stream with me here today. So he's going to help actually demo some of the ZBrush 2021 uh, assets in here. So he's been part of the beta team for this release, and he's been doing some really fantastic stuff with the tools, a lot of different creative ways to use these new features that we have added into the version here. So he's going to help along here. We're going to switch back and forth, and um, I'm going to show some things, and we'll give it to Pavlovich, and he's going to show some stuff as well. So it should be an exciting stream here today. Now, I'm sure you have all have seen the trailer. Have you guys seen that yet? The one we posted for ZBrush 2020 with some of the things that we're gonna show here today. Um, if you have not, I'm gonna get uh, Kyle here. He's uh, helping in the stream here today to run that video really quick. And then we're gonna get into the sculpting. So Kyle, whenever you're ready. So there you go. That was the initial trailer. There. We want to thank everyone that participated in our beta testing for ZBrush 2021 and also allowing us to use their assets and images for this release. Now, I see a lot of questions in the chat right now that are already asking, well, when can we get this? 
So I'm debating right now to tell you immediately a way to a little longer in the stream. What, what do you guys think? Should I tell you now or should we wait? Should we actually show you some stuff first and then and then tell you? What do you think, Michael? Uh, I mean, you're way meaner than I am, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's at least, let, if we're going to say, I mean, let's at least get into ZBrush here first. At least at least be in ZBrush when we release the uh, information. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So Kyle's going to hop me over to my screen here. So now we're going to give you a little preview of some of these elements so you guys can be able to get with this new version. And as you can see here, the top of my screen here says ZBrush 2021. There's no, there's no beta on that title there. So just maybe a little hint there of when you guys will be able to uh, get this here shortly. <laughs> we'll hold off for, we'll, we'll show some stuff and then, then we'll tell you the, the release. But you're gonna like it, you're gonna like it. All right, so since we've all been kind of in this weird um, kind of scenario, it is kind of summertime. Um, we've all been trapped at our computers here for a while. So I've created this little kind of Zcation scene. So if you're, you know, <laughs> I need a vacation. Um, <laughs> and so basically just a little scene here to kind of demonstrate some of these different items that we've included in ZBrush 2021. Now, one of the main things you're gonna notice here at the top is there has now been a new tab that has been added. So this little palette bar at the top here, it's pretty much never has seen like a new addition to that palette bar. We did during the last re release add a help area. So you could actually go to help and then you know search online docs and uh, get some more information on items inside of ZBrush. But we have now added this Dynamics palette. Now this Dynamics palette is going to be kind of the core element in this release. And there's a lot of things in here that you can do with this palette to allow you to control simulation inside of ZBrush. So what this means is instead of coming through and sculpting something manually, you can use the Dynamics now to give you a start on different objects and allow you to do different things. And then you can go into your normal set of tools and ZBrush usage and detail them out even further. So a lot, a lot of power, full stuff in here. And a lot of this presentation today that you're gonna see is gonna be focusing on this dynamics. We do have some other things in this release as well, but the main core of it, going back and forth with me and Michael here is kind of different ways in which these dynamics can be used. So first, I'm going to come over here. I'm just going to grab a simple little start scene here that I have to kind of explain to you guys how this dynamic stuff is functioning. So here I just have a towel and that little kind of inner tube from the Zcation kind of element there. And with this towel, I'm just going to come and drag this and place it over the inner tube here. And if you've noticed in the kind of palette here for the dynamics, we have this gigantic gravity button that's kind of highlighted here. And what this is gonna allow me to do is allow me to take this object, which is this towel here, and I can run the simulation and this is going to drop it using gravity and then have it collide with things in the scene. So if I come over here and just click run simulation initially, you're gonna see that the towel is going to drop However, it's going to drop all the way down to the floor and you can see it did not collide with that inner tube. So what I need to do is I need to tell ZBrush, hey, let's add a collision volume to my scene so I can drop this towel and then have it deform when it hits that object. Now the collision volumes inside of ZBrush are gonna be turned on by activating this little collision volume button over here. And when you turn this on, what ZBrush is going to do, it's going to look at any subtools in your scene that are not the one that's currently selected and that have an eyeball option icon turned on. So currently I have the towel selected. If I do the collision volume here, it's going to calculate that. And what it's going to calculate as my collision volume is this inner tube subtool over here. So this was a unselected subtool and it had the eyeball icon turned on. So now if I take this again and run that simulation, you're gonna see it's gonna come across and now it's gonna go around the tube like that. So this is kind of your, you know, standard simulation stuff. So I can move it around, I can rotate it, I can angle it, I can position it, you know, anywhere I want, run that simulation again, it's going to collide with the object like that. Now, since the collision volume is calculated and kind of stored in memory as you do this, I can also turn off the inner tube. And then if I redo that simulation again, you're going to see it's still going to see that inner tube as my collision element. And this is really handy in some of the stuff you're going to see as 
create today because basically you can use primitives and different objects as your collision volumes and then run the dynamics across them, but then they don't have to be visible in your scene. They're just adding a different element for those as a collision so that you can get a different shape or form out of it. So really kind of cool stuff with that. Now, that's, you know, that's the basics, the basics of stuff here, but we couldn't just stop with that. We had to keep adding more because that's, you know, what we do. So I'm going to come over here and just now select the move brush here. And next to this gravity button here, we have this liquefy option. And what liquefy is going to do, it's going to take the gravity simulation and it's going to allow you to now guide it. So you can actually use this guided gravity simulation. And what this is going to allow you to do is if I come across a surface here, so that my towel, and I just make a area on it that deviates from the rest of it. So with the move brush here, I'm just gonna make a little dimple, right? So I've got pretty much the whole flat towel here and then a little dimple where I've just taken the move brush and made a depression in that shape. Now, if I run the simulation again with that gravity option turned on, you're gonna see that that is where the gravity is going to start from. It's going to look at that deviation across that mesh and it's going to then start the gravity simulation from there. So this is a really cool thing because now I can just come across like edges of my towel here and run that simulation and it's now gonna give me a totally different effect. So I can now have it you know, fall off in one direction. If I wanted to crease down the middle, I can say even say the standard brush and just drag a gully in my shape there and then run that simulation and you're gonna see it's gonna start from that area. Now, at any time, you can stop the simulation. So as it's running, it's going to keep going basically until it hits the ground. There is also the option to turn off the floor. So if I take my towel here and kind of move it a little bit over here, and then we'll go in with that standard brush again. We're going to add a little dimple there. And we'll turn the floor off and run that collision. You can see now it's going to go through. And then it's going to go all the way out of the inner tube there and keep going into space. So you have the option for floor collision. They also will respect when that simulation stops. So this process of just using this functionality is you know, very simplistic. You can just sculpt on it. And then wherever you've created that deviation, you're going to get a nice result from that cloth. Now, in addition to this, let me come up here and turn off liquefy here is that we've also added some other ways you can control the simulation as well. So here I have another example. So I have just this ring here and then another kind of towel, simple object that I can actually use with simulation. So I'm gonna come over here and recalculate my volume on this. This is gonna allow me to take the cloth I have here and then I can actually manipulate it through this ring. So to do this, in addition to just using the simulation palette over here and dropping the objects, I can use that you know, sculptural marks on it to get the controlled gravity or the guided gravity to have it fall. But we also added a bunch of sculpting brushes. And so at the top here, you'll see there's a lot of these brushes that are labeled cloth and then something else. We have a cloth ball, a cloth dimple, cloth fold, cloth hook. And there's a whole bunch of different brushes through here. Now, I'm not going to go through all these in just this big beginning start of this, but as we go through this presentation today, we're gonna to hit a lot of these brushes and these are gonna be used in various different things. So the first one I'm gonna show here is the cloth hook brush. And if I grab this one here and then take a large brush size, I can come through and just move this around. So if I click and drag, you can see I can start deforming the cloth and this will allow me to you know, move it around just as I kind of would expect it would, right? Like if I drag one side and bring it into the other, it's gonna start bunching up. And I can also take this and start pulling it through different forms. And this is gonna allow me to get those different shapes and designs. So using proxy elements to kind of drag other objects through to get that dynamic to change. And then now I can simply hide that proxy object and I have a different shape. So after I have something like this, I could come through and then rotate this. You know, Then I could mask, say, portion of my towel here and then run even more gravity on this. Let me put this down a little bit here. And then I can start you know, making a kind of towel aspect out of that. So different ways you can use the simulation inside of ZBrush just to generate different things. So thinking in different ways to do it, but we have a whole bunch of cloth brushes. You've had that guided simulation we just saw. And then we also have the panel over here that will allow you to change those elements and you can use gravity for those effects. Now I'm gonna go back over here to my scene here. Actually, let me not, let's go here one more time. So we've talked about the 
thoughts options. We talked about the gravity options. We also have another way <laughs> you can manipulate these dynamics as well. And so this is with a new transpose brush. So if I go to my brush palette here and come down here, you see here's the normal transpose. And if this is active, you know, I can perform that move, that scale, that rotate, that reposition. However, we also have added now this transpose cloth. And what the transpose cloth brush is going to allow you to do, it's going to allow you to run the simulation, but you're going to be running it through transpose. So what this means is that as I drag my plane object here using this transpose brush, it is now running the simulation. So if I set my collision volume and then drag it here, you can see as it hits that inner tube, it's going to deform. And then I can reposition this, have it hit again. I can come to the side here, may want to scale it, which is going to apply more of that cloth transitioning, scale it this way, collide it with that inner tube some more, maybe drag it across the inner tube, maybe drag it down into the inner tube. So just using this transpose cloth, I can now manipulate that cloth even more. And this is going to run that simulation in real time. So this is a lot of fun for coming in and just kind of distorting things. And you're gonna see a lot of this kind of usage with the brushes, with the transpose cloth stuff, as we go through and start manipulating these different designs. So I'm gonna go back to my scene here, and I have one that has a lot of stuff that hasn't been kind of followed yet, because I basically just wanted to give you the basic example of how this kind of works first, before we go into kind of the real, real knit and grit of all this. So I have the towel here on the floor selected, and we were already talking about the transpose option. So I just have the transpose cloth brush here selected. And with this, you can even take this to another level of functionality. So before I was just moving this, scaling it, and it was just distorting. However, there's an option we have that's called on mast. And if we run this on mast option, what it's going to do, it's going to move the mast portion relative to the unmasked portion. So I know this sounds a little bit complex, but this is pretty much all you need to remember is what I'm going to show you here. Oh, it's this thing, okay? So here's the gizmo, and if I move this, you can see as I move it, I'm moving the unmasked part of this, and the rest is following it where it goes. So you can see as I move this around, it's following the position, and the masked portion is moving to where I'm putting that unmasked part. So what I can do with this is I can start dragging this, and if I drag it in a circle, right, I can actually start colliding with itself and I can now create this kind of rolled up towel effect. So now I've gone through and just manipulated that piece of geometry and then rolled it up and now I have the shape. Now once I'm here, I can still distort it. You can see using that cloth brush, I can move it up and down. I can even make it like tighter. So you have a lot of functionality using this. And this is just using that unmasked, op unmasked option with the transpose cloth brush. So really fun stuff with that one. So now I'm going to zoom back out here to my scene. And now let's just mess with this a little bit more here. So I've got my towel roll on the ground there. I have a few towels and an umbrella that I need to do something with as well. So I'm just going to go through and just kind of show you how easy it is to kind of use these new functionalities. So let's say with these kind of um, chairs here, basically these are your standard vacation chairs you'd see beside a pool, maybe at the beach. Just have that piece of cloth, and when you sit in it, that's going to kind of conform to your body, right, in between that frame. So I want to get that effect happening in the scene here. So to do this, I can come over here and disable my collision volume. I don't really need that now. I can have my gravity turned on here. I'm going to set this maybe to 5. And then I'm going to up my firmness here of my cloth and make sure on mast is off. And then if I run the simulation on that, you can see it's going to now use that gravity, and I had the points on the top and the bottom of that mass, so now I'm getting this nice gravity effect. I can also come on with the cloth brush, you know, manipulate that round if I want to. I go to the next one, run the same thing. So now I've got both of those set up. For the towel here, I can do that same kind of process. So I'm just gonna grab that towel. I'm gonna calculate my collision volume really quick. And then make sure I have that set. And then I'm going to adjust my firmness here. And then we're going to run the simulation this time. And that towel is now going to drape around that chair. I can now go to this one over here. Once again, I can use, say, that cloth transpose brush and just pull it down, you know, have it collide with that element there, move it around, change it, make it a little wrinkled, a little bit compressed, may rotate a little bit. So you can see how this is all kind of coming into play here. And then finally, for, say, my 
umbrella here. I can select that. And this will also do that same kind of process. So I'm going to change my inflate value for my calculation, make it a little bit smaller here. If my number pad wants to work for me. And then we're going to run the simulation on that. Oh, we actually jumped out of the simulation there. Let me get my inflate there. And so the inflate option is going to allow you to calculate how much inflate your actual um, collision volume will have. So you have the ability to increase the volume around your collision objects so that when the cloth happens, it won't adhere exactly to the surface. It can actually clear above it a little bit if you want. And so as I run that, you can see my gravity is a little bit too high. Let's turn that down a little bit. And so there we go. Now we got that a nice umbrella as well. So there we have kind of the basics there. So as we go through the stream today, we're going to pass it back and forth. So I'm going to hand it over to Michael here in a second, and he's going to show some more stuff on this level of things. And then we're going to show you a ton of examples uh, using this dynamic stuff and some for some really cool different effects. So Michael, are you ready? Uh, I think so. Get Michael's screen there. I'm up. Cool. So uh, first of all, I want to be very clear that, you know, they toss the word ZBrush master out real, real easy. I'm not a master. I'm an enthusiastic young man about Z, not that young anymore, but I, I just like ZBrush a lot. And there's, a, I, it's kind of my crutch to kind of do things uh, quickly and easily. So I'm going to start vanilla a little bit, but one thing I did notice in the uh, discussion that they were talking about is like, is there any like limitations or I'm, I'm a developer of the O5s. So whenever I think, uh, you know, dynamics or, cloth or anything like that, I'm, my mind immediately goes to, and I did enjoy reading the uh, <laughs> the comments as they came through, by the way. Um, yeah, okay, does everything have to be quads or what, what's what's the catch? Um, and this this thing, dynamics, it's, it's essentially evaluating relationships between points uh, using an algorithm that'll go through and make sure that they're maintaining surface area and have a whole bunch of uh, options for you. But you can use this on anything. You know, you can go through here, we have gravity floor collision. Uh, let's turn that strength down a little bit. We can tilt our dog a little bit. And then we can just run the simulation. And I guess we can turn that strength up a little bit. You can change the speed, you know, and that kind of affects how things work too. You can turn on self collision so that as these things are colliding, it's looking at itself and it's evaluating, just constantly reevaluating those relationships between edges and making sure that like things aren't colliding as much, or if you want them to collide, you have that option. So it may look like, you know, what does all this do? But actually once you learn, uh, you know, and everybody was like, hey, what are we gonna do any deep dives? Absolutely, you know me and my playlist, so we'll, we'll get there. But, you know, I just wanted to make sure that everybody saw, and then we can go brush cloth hook, you know, you can, you can just, you can go zany with this stuff on anything. Uh, it's it's cool stuff. Uh, and, and in the beta, it, it was all about cloth simulation, cloth this, cloth that. The first six or seven tests that I did had nothing to do with cloth. It was like, what now that we have dynamic relationships and uh, collision surface uh, volumes and surfaces, what can we use? You can use that for retopology and snapping verts into place from different meshes and. Uh, you know, rec simulations we'll get to. So, so many cool things you can do with this uh, that just use the simulation technology. So I'm gonna go in here to a plane and make a poly mesh 3D. And uh, so we just have a poly plane here. Now, uh, if we go down here underneath geometry, you may have noticed uh, there was a dynamic down here and now we have thickness. So this is just a preview thickness and it also has a little smooth so div. I'm gonna turn that down to zero and I'm gonna make this so we can see a little bit better. So we now have dynamic thickness um, and used to be, it was smooth subdiv and creasing and that kind of thing. Well, now you have a thickness here. So I would do shift D and then D to turn that back on. I can just toggle between uh, this kind of fake preview thickness. Um, now, if I wanna make a pillow, what I can do over here is I can, uh, I can you would think, okay, let me go over here to inflate because I wanna inflate this pillow and I'm gonna run the simulation here. Let's go ahead and turn off floor collision and gravity. So I'm gonna run the simulation and it just takes off. So the reason for that, let me give you a little visual. Let me go out of edit mode here. And we'll just grab this and we're gonna go down here to initialize and we're gonna say, give me just a Q grid here. And with this Q grid, I need an arrow. And we'll grab an arrow here. And I'm gonna rotate this around. And we're gonna scale it down. So basically I'm just gonna give us a visual representation of surface normal. So we're gonna take this arrow here and we're just gonna put this right here and then we're gonna merge this down. So basically I'm gonna give you a little sneak preview of uh, micro poly. 
which is going to change every single face on my object with this object here. So let's go back to our plane 3D here. I'm going to turn off thickness, and we have a micro poly now. Now, this is another thing that's just insanely cool. I can make this chain mail now. Um, let's go back to here so we can see a little bit better. So now we have chain mail. Uh, that was another thing too is uh, that I saw in the comments is can we change the resolution to get different types of wrinkles? Absolutely. In fact, I can go like I can hit reconstruct a couple times and this is you know the result I get. Um, and then I can go up in subdivision levels and I can still go on you know, a brush cloth hook and I can pull this around. Let me turn, let me see. Delete higher here, micro poly. Um, you know, you're basically putting this chainmail link on everything uh, on your object here. So what I'm going to do is let's go back to where we had our three and delete lower. I'm going to change this micro poly out. You can do custom micro polys if you want to, but I'm going to hold down Control and tap and just grab in our little visual representation here. I'm going to turn off line, and you're going to see um, all these little arrows are pointing straight out. So when I went to inflate, all it did was just you know push in one uh, one direction here, so let me micro poly off here. Oh, um, inflate on brushed. Let me just grab a plane here. Hold on just a second. So again, we make this poly mesh three D here, and we do uh, the run simulation, and it's just pointing right along here. And then this geometry here, we can turn on dynamic. We don't have thickness on. And then this micro poly, we'll just go ahead and put in our plane here. We'll turn off smooth. So again, these lines are pointing in one direction. So they're just going to inflate in one direction. Um, and again, it's just looking at those relationships. So if I was to go through here and like put a little change in here, now I can run the inflate and the uh, simulation will start doing stuff. In fact, I can do like a deflate and it'll kind of push against itself here. So now that we kind of have an idea of how this is working, I'm going to go in here and we have dynamics. I'm going to just throw a thickness on here. And in order for this side to inflate against this side, what I need to do is make this real geometry. So I'm going to go over here and hit apply. And then we're going to go over here to inflate. And now when I run the simulation, you're going to see it's just going to inflate like a little pillow. So let's switch back over here to our startup material. And uh, again, like we mentioned before, as we're running the simulation, if I turn on dynamic, uh, let's turn off thickness here. We don't need micro poly on. I mean, you can turn micro poly on if you want to see the little how how those normals are interacting. So when we do an inflate and a deflate, how it's how it's working. But uh, let's go through here and let's talk about subdivision. So when I go to subdivide this, I can hit Control D, or I can just hit Divide. You're going to see I get more geometry. So if we have a floor collision turned on and we turn our floor on, that's essentially what it's going to be colliding with. We can turn back on gravity. And then as I run this gravity here, you're going to see I can run the simulation and it's just going to collapse uh, in uh, onto the floor. Um, so you can also go through here. We can, if you want bigger wrinkles, you can go ahead and run it on lower resolution geometry and get those nice big primary reads. Um, but then it's not very smooth. Well, remember, under dynamic, you can give it a smooth preview. So you still have, if I do shift D, um, you still have low uh, subdivision geometry here. But it's previewing what it's going to look like when it's smooth. So I can run the simulation. I get those nice big folds. If I want more resolution, I can go ahead and hit Control D. We'll get to like 34,000. Now, when I either I can either run the simulation or like uh, Joseph was doing. And I, again, that gravity speed can be dictated up here. Let's go ahead and change smooth so they're down to one. You can also use uh, BTC for your transpose cloth brush. So as we go through here, we can kind of just bounce it off the floor, or we can rotate it and squish it uh, onto here. And you can also do that at a higher subdivision level and get more better wrinkles. And you can also tell it again what firmness you want. So if you want more silky or more canvassy, um, if you want it to self collide, all that good stuff. So we've got that here. And it's also ZBrush. So also consider, it's like, okay, yeah, I've got a, a pillow, cool. Well, what about all the other little modeling things that I wanna do? Uh, I can just go through here. Let's go ahead and, well, let's just duplicate this off real quick and I say delete lower. And I'm gonna grab this uh, outside edge, or you know, I can do both sides if I want to. Let's, say, let's grab this one here and I'm gonna say, uh, we can delete hidden, or we can just go right into our stroke menu. And we can say, you know, stroke our open border here. Then we'll go to uh, brush curve, multi tube, and just drop, you know, any sort of 
curves that you want on here to put in some, you know, whatever, whatever you want to put. You can use that for fringe. You can use that for, um, you know, you know, what is it called? Piping, that kind of thing. Super easy. So anything you're used to uh, using in ZBrush, all available to you. Um, but yeah, so we've got that and we've got uh, transpose and moving stuff around. So now let's talk a little bit more about those cloth brushes uh, that Joseph brought up. So if I go here to BC, that's going to narrow it down to our cloth brushes. And uh, these are cool. I mean, you can go in here with like your cloth hook brush and you can kind of just pull this geometry around. Um, and you can go in here to say, uh, on what cloth twister is a really cool one. And you may be thinking, oh, what kind of programmatic geniuses came up with these brushes? Hey, it must be impossible to create. In fact, um, it's actually pretty easy to create a, a cloth brush. Um, all you need to do is, so for this instance, let's go to BS spiral. Go into our brush options here, and you're going to see an elasticity and a simulation iteration. So right now, if I just use the spiral, it just spirals my geometry. As soon as I go over here and say, hey, use simulation, now when I use spiral, it's going to use cloth simulation. And in this particular instance, um, you can go in here and change your twist rate, and this is essentially what that cloth twist is doing. So you can go through here, and you can twist this cloth up, and it's using simulation just by putting on a button. Um, so well, that's cool. Um, also, so that's a new option. And over here underneath stroke, you're also going to have um, stroke jitter and brush imperfection. So one brush I like to use for that, go to BC, and there is a uh, cloth pinch trails. And this actually brings up um, another thing. So brush modifiers, there's little trails down here. So, uh, so if I go through and I drag this through, you're going to see it's going to update my mesh. And let's go ahead and go to a slightly, I need, in this instance, I need a little more geometry to kind of go through and start uh, making the object behave how I want. So now as I drag this through, um, speed kind of dictates as well. If you're giving it more time to calculate, it's it's constantly calculating um, the simulation iterations behind the scene. So while you're adjusting your mesh, <clears throat> it's calculating uh, the surface of your mesh. And you may notice over here too, you have on brushed. So that's gonna give me a little halo around here. If I turn that off, it's gonna simulate the entire object. So as I'm pulling this down, it's calculating all those relationships, all those surface um, surface area that it's trying to maintain because it's a cloth simulation. It's doing it across the entire object. Or if you want to, you know, just put it into just this area, um, you can turn this on. You can actually fade this border out a little bit, and uh, that'll get you that result. Uh, but going back to the stroke here. Uh, we talked about brush imperfection, so I can turn this up, and this basically just adds like a little bit of noise um, to your brush here. You can see it's kind of peppering in some noise on that. And then the jitter over here, if I crank that up, um, well, first of all, let me just take the stroke menu and put it over here so we can see it. So uh, stroke jitter is at zero, and I'm going to go through here with my cloth trails, and this is the result I'm going to get. As soon as I turn on stroke jitter up, you're going to see now it's kind of hopping all over the place. So if you want to like make that scar or that uh, puckering a little more erratic, um, you can you can absolutely do that. And then down here underneath the trails, this is another option. So as I crank this trails up, it's essentially in anything in ZBrush, if you hover over, it's going to tell you what it is. And then you tap control, it'll give you even more uh, information on it. So it's like a built-in little help menu here. You can go through here and you can keep, it'll just keep applying that stroke. So that'll continue to uh, reiterate that stroke that you're making. And I cranked it up uh, quite a bit, but you know, you know, play around with this number and see uh, what value it gets you. So it keeps applying that stroke and maintains uh, that sharpness because what happens with uh, cloth sometimes is it wants to, again, maintain those relationships so it can start um, fading out a little bit. And one more example of, that cloth uh, on mask here. So if you go through here and you can use this dimple and let's go ahead and turn on our dynamics here. And so it's on brush, if we turn off on brush. Now it's gonna go through. Now we are hopping that around. I didn't turn off underneath our stroke here. I got stroke jitter up, so that's why it's behaving a little bit erratically. But now you can see it's affecting the entire cloth surface. Or if I don't want to, if I want to maintain, you know, just a border around it, just go simply go down here to unbrushed, pull this on through. And if you want to fade that area out, just change that fade border up a bit and you can do that. And you can also, you know, it's a drag rect, but if you want to make them all the same size, just drag dot and just kind of wiggle. So it's getting that simulation to go. And now you can go through there and do that. So 
we've done a pillow. We've talked about inflate and expand. And, uh, you know, going in here to like, say your standard brush and simply going down here and saying, hey, simulation iterations. And then you can even tell it in the dynamics, hey, while I'm sculpting and I want simulation, uh, contract as well. So while I'm sculpting, or, you know, probably a better one is expand. Um, while I'm sculpting with the um, standard brush, it's going to affect um, this cloth. So I can use this as like a cloth uh, ball buildup. And again, you can change your subdivision. So you can go through and it'll make bigger folds, or you can crank it up and you can get smaller folds and you can put it on brushed or off brushed. A lot of uh, really cool stuff. However, made a pillow. What if we wanted to do something, because this is fine, you got a surface against the surface so you can inflate it. But what if you want to inflate a bunch of surfaces together? And this is where it's just kind of fun to play with ZBrush. Like what, what ZBrush functionality do we have that'll allow us to do that? And uh, add to that the new dynamic uh, properties. So what I can do is, let's do that real quick. So I'm gonna go in here real quick and we're just gonna go down here to initialize and I'm just gonna grab like a six riz Q grid here. And um, essentially what I want to do, this is also another thing that's in Z modeler. Um, we're going to go heavier in Z modeler later, but you can go through here and there's a new inset equidistant uh, setting. So you have the legacy equidistant standard and then equidistant, you got size limits and you got snapping um, as it tries to maintain that equidistant um, radius, it'll go through and do some stuff you can uh, have a little bit of fun with. So you have equidistant capabilities. So I'm going to go here, polygroup all, and it's going to go ahead and do a region and we can go ahead and pull this in and get perfect equidistant uh, edges there. Uh, what I'm gonna do is go in here and I'm gonna do a insert single edge loop. Let's go ahead and turn on uh, transform, activate symmetry in the X and Y, I believe. I'm just gonna put in uh, a little thing. So basically I'm gonna use micro poly one more time to go ahead and take, I wanna replace every face with just geometry. And the reason I'm putting in those little edges is I wanna use those for masks. So I'm gonna make a little poly group here Let's make that a little more obvious. There we go. So I've got a blue poly group and a red poly group. So I'm gonna use the red poly group for masking on my comforter. And I'm gonna use this as a micro poly. So I can see it. I'm gonna name this square. And then I'm gonna go out here. Uh, you know what? Just grab my trusty plane again, make poly mesh 3D. And you could go to initialize and you know make whatever divisions you want. You can also go in here to geometry and reconstruct. And I can just hit this. So this is a little low. It's like four comforter squares wide. Um, this is a little high. So I think right here, uh, Goldilocks style, I think this is just right. So I'm gonna go ahead and say delete higher. And now I'm gonna replace every single one of these faces using what we already know, which is dynamic and turning micro poly on. And we're gonna hold down control and just grab that uh, comforter square. So now we have uh, a plane that we can go through and we can uh, make a bed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna append a poly mesh 3D here, and let's go back down here to our Q cube. Let's go out of solo mode so we can see both of these. I'm gonna put just a bed underneath here. So we're gonna go ahead and scale this out. Oh, I still have fresh transpose cloth. So I'm gonna go to regular old transpose here. Regular old transpose so it doesn't think I'm trying to simulate anything. And let's go ahead and stretch this out a little bit. We'll push this, uh, this away. So here's our, here's our bed we want to simulate the sheet on. Uh, I'm going to go through here. And in this instance, let's go in here to dynamic, turn our smooth up to one, maybe crank up our Q grid and our coverage, change that to a chamfer and get a nice rounded cube here. And we go ahead and apply that. And I'm going to take my sheet, move it up. And now, as we know, this is real geometry. So now we just simply need to go over here. Uh, we're going to do floor collision, gravity. Um, we can set the gravity direction and it's already just going to fall straight down. Uh, we need to set a collision volume. So this, we just calculate a collision volume. And if we ever change that, all we got to do is hit recalc. And then we're going to go through here and we're going to say run simulation. And oops, set the direction here. There we go. Now, uh, it's a micro poly. So there's not a whole lot of actual geometry here. We haven't set apply. It's actually just simulating this low, low res geometry. So my mistake, let's go in here and apply it. So this is real geometry now. And then we'll run that simulation. There we go. So now it's simulating uh, as we might expect. Um, however, 
uh, it, there's no thickness and we haven't inflated it yet. But at this stage, you can still go through here and do like a brush cloth. You know, my, my old favorite is a little cloth hook to go through here and just kind of like wrinkle this up. And, and again, turn on self collision. You can rerun the simulation with gravity if you want to. You can do um, under here, underneath dynamic, let's turn micro poly off. You can turn on smooth subdivision. So you can see, you know, the wrinkles a little bit smoother as you're going through and modifying this geometry. Um, so now we need to th start thinking about, okay, how do we actually inflate this thing to give us ourselves that, that uh, comforter look using simple ZBrush methodology combined with uh, the new dynamic stuff we have. So how we're gonna do that is we can go over here to dynamic and we can give ourselves some thickness and this is gonna add uh, that thickness. That's another thing too I, I saw mentioned was, can you change that collision distance? Yes, over here underneath inflate, you just drop that number down and then now when we run uh, the simulation, it'll get even closer to that collision surface. So that's how you do that. Um, so we have this here and we have thickness, but again, this is just a preview thickness. It's not actually gonna inflate against each other. And to kind of get rid of some of those, you know, maybe possibly coplanar faces, we're gonna go over here to smoothness and crank that up. So we can kind of alleviate some of that stress in there. Uh, so we have this and what we're gonna need to do is make this thickness real. So we have two real surfaces um, being able to inflate against each other. So we have thickness, uh, smoothness, smooth subdiv, we'll turn this down and we'll go ahead and hit apply. So now we have real thickness in here and then we'll turn dynamic back on, thickness down, turn on our smooth preview so we can see these wrinkles nice and smooth. And now all we need to do is use our masking that we have. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this poly group here, grab this poly group, make it all one poly group, control W, make it all one poly group. And now I can go through here and I can say, um, let's take this poly group here and I'm gonna do a control tap to invert that or to grab that and then control tap the mask that, or invert that mask. And then we're gonna go over here to uh, turn off gravity, turn off floor collision, let's do an inflate. Uh, we can even turn off our collision volume. I mean, you don't have to, but I'm just gonna inflate this here so that we can run the simulation. And now we can get um, this kind of comforter surface, kind of these little pockets inflating against each other. And of course, if you actually need more wrinkles or more geometry to kind of sell the look you're going for, all you got to do is um, we hit control D to give us more wrinkles. And again, your brushes are going to make this behave. You know, you're going to get smaller. Let's go ahead and turn our collision volume back on. You're going to get smaller, more refined wrinkles as you have um, more geometry to play around with. And when we go through here and do uh, this again, so we're going to control tap and invert that and we do our inflate on subdivision level two. Now when we inflate, you know, we're gonna get uh, more, let's turn the smooth up to here. So now you're gonna get more wrinkles in through here and you can use all those cool cloth brushes to go through here and what can you do? You can do twister is my favorite. So I'll go through here and just twist these up and hold down all and do everything you need to do to uh, run that cloth simulation. So I think that's it for that first run. Does that all make sense? You made sense. You made sense. So yeah, some of the things we had in the chat. Um, definitely, you can use the transpose cloth to m use with the simulation as well as he's doing this. And then we had some things you can always like if you want to have a sphere and then have a a ball collide in the sphere to get that kind of hit. Like say you're doing like bullet damage or something like that. Um, you can just set up your collision volume. So if you want the whatever sub tool you have selected is what's going to deform. And then whatever you don't have selected that has that eyeball icon turned on, when you turn on that collision volume, it's gonna use that as its reference. So if you wanted to have a plane object and then you wanted to have a ball hit it like a bullet, um, basically you would have that plane selected, you'd have your bullet, and then you'd move your plane in your bullet and it would deform the plane around that. Uh, we have some more examples that will kind of show that kind of process coming up too. So now I'm going to take it back, and we're gonna we're gonna show you some other things. <clears throat> so one of the other requests, this is just on the fly. This is what I was over here doing. I saw like a question. Well, can we see it on this? And then I was like, okay, well I'll make this really quick. So I, I just whipped this up. That's why I was looking so busy and intent over here. That's really what it was. I was just I was making a model for you guys. That's it. Just, come on. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so here I have an example of. Uh, kind of a figure here, because we had some questions, well, 
can, can I do it for clothing? Of course you can do it for clothing. So that, that's kind of the thing of it. But the thing is that this is a dynamic simulation. So it's not just for clothing. It's for all, everything else that can be related to dynamics. This is why, you know, starting out with the basics of just deforming things and then Pavlov is showing it can be used in this way and this way. That's the core principle of it is that it's dynamics. It's not just for cloth. It's for everything that can have dynamic functionality. Um, so as an example here, here I have a just a figure here and then um, she's got a little t-shirt on and so this shirt here was all done with just the dynamics. So there is no hand sculpting on this. Um, there may have been one usage of the kind of cloth hook brush on this as well, but in general this was all just using the collision stuff that we kind of already talked about. So taking this and deforming it to get this effect. So I'm going to go through the process of how to create this and show you guys the functionality of this because we've added some new things as well. Um, to some additional features, some additional functionality that's allowing us to kind of create these things a little bit faster now inside of ZBrush. So I'm gonna go back to my kind of base here for her and I'm just gonna zoom her in a little bit here. And basically I wanna start, you know, I wanna give her a garment. So to create a garment, basically I could use the extract method where I could come in and start masking parts out. This would give me a surface and then I can take that and, you know, generate a shape off of that and then use the simulation and have that constrict back to her body. Uh, one thing that we wanted to do is kind of different. Uh, one idea we came up with was we had this feature called Snapshot 3D that we introduced a few uh, versions ago. And this would allow you to take a black and white image, basically an alpha, and then you could take that and it would turn it into geometry. So you could import these alphas, you could modify them, and then you could turn them into geometry. So we did something similar for the cloth stuff. And if I go into Lightbox here and go to Spotlight, you can see you're not gonna have these little clothing uh, Spotlight files. They're gonna be loaded by default in this version. And if I open up one of these, you see this is what kind of gonna get. So I have all these different little Spotlight versions of clothing over here. And if I just move these out a little bit, you can see they're just silhouettes. So just think of them as like your basic silhouettes for cloth. Like you don't have to do anything complex. They can really be low res, it doesn't really matter. But basically, if you want a shirt or a dress or anything like that, just think of it as a silhouette. So if you're viewing it from the front, what would it be in just black and white? And these are all just created, you know, inside of, uh, I used the affinity for uh, these things. And so I have this kind of shirt here and I'm simply just gonna position this where I want it on my scene. Now you'll also notice with these that there's some coloring on these spotlights as well. And so before in the previous version of Spotlight, when you just had an alpha, it would just take whatever you know, values that was transparent and not transparent and would give you a shape from it. So now we've added the functionality that Spotlight will now, and Snapshot 3D will actually allow you to transfer color information from that image to the mesh itself. And this will also give you polygrouping. So these little lines here that have been drawn on this map here are going to allow me to isolate and then skip the bridging between them. Because basically I don't want a huge chunk of geometry going through my model because then it's solid, right? So it's not like a shirt. A shirt or a t-shirt like this, it's gonna have a front panel, a back panel, and then areas cut in between, right? So I'm gonna take this and I'm just going to, you know, generate a snapshot 3D from this. We've also added a control functionality. You can add the divisions in between that front panel and the back panel. And that can be done by clicking on the snap this snapshot 3D button here and then rotating it. And this little dial is gonna update and it's gonna allow you to add divisions between your mesh. So after that has been processed, you can see this is what I get here. And if I turn on my poly paint, you can see that I have that red coloring that I had on that original texture has been transferred to the mesh. And then this is also giving poly grouping. So I can hold control and shift and then just isolate these parts out. And now I'm left with just that front, back, and side area. And I have holes for that simulation to work around. Now, Pavlovich was showing that thickness process. And that's another thing that comes into play when doing stuff like this. So I can generate things single-sided, use the simulation on them. And then later on, I can determine, hey, I want this to be thicker. I want this to be thinner. And I don't have to go through and reconstruct that inner thickness. I can do it dynamically with that dynamic thickness now. So I've got my front of my shirt here. And this is the resolution of that. And now I'm just gonna use the simulation for this. And so what I wanna do is I wanna take this shape and I want it to start conforming to her. So instead of it having going all at once around her, I just basically want it going down the Z axis. So she's facing front and back and I just want it to constrict around the front and back sides. So I'm gonna come over here to the contract option. And in here, I'm going to set my value here, so it's only happening in Z. So this means only gonna happen in the front and back space of this model. And then if I change my amount, maybe to two here, 
and then run this, you're gonna see that form's gonna start contracting. Now you'll notice that it's starting to go through the mesh through here. So this is happening because I didn't have a collision volume set for this mesh. So you wanna make sure you also recalculate that. And we're talking about that inflate earlier. I can set this down to 0.25 is usually my, my happy number for things like this. And then I can recalculate that. And once again, the recalculation of this collision is gonna go through and look at any subtool I don't have selected that has its eyeball icon turned on and make a collision volume around that. So it's prison volume currently for this mesh includes the body and the hair. So that is the volume that's been calculated. And now if I run the simulation here, you're gonna see it start contracting to the shape here. And the amount of topology is Michael was tending on is gonna allow you to determine how small or large wrinkles are. So if I wanted this to be really, 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 really skin tight, I could leave this here if I wanted, but I'm gonna clean this up a little bit. And with the cleanup process, you could use you know, smooth to come in and start smoothing some of these areas out. But you'll notice oftentimes when you try to use the normal smooth brush on areas like this, it's not gonna allow you to kind of smooth that area out. And this is happening because the default smooth brush has a function that's turned on that will restrict any points on a model that have less than three uh, edges connected to it. So it's not gonna smooth any points that have less than three edges uh, connected to it. So what this is, is so what we've done rather, is we've added a new smooth brush, which removes this restriction or actually applies the value. And now you can smooth open edges. And this is gonna help a lot in cleaning up these single-sided pieces of geometry. So I'm gonna go to the brush pad over here and then isolate by the letter S. And in here we have now a smooth cloth brush and I can select that brush. And now with this, I can come through and if I hit those edges again, you can see I can start smoothing those out. So it's gonna allow me to smooth out any of those kind of abnormalities um, that are coming around that area there. So I'm just smoothing out my initial mesh here so And then I'm gonna thicken up these areas on the top here that kind of got a little distorted. So just using the move brush on this. And this is just your standard uh, ZBrush fare right now. So nothing with the dynamics is really happening right now. Just kind of reconfiguring stuff to make sure everything wraps nicely where I want it to go. Just making these a little bit thicker through here. And then the topology of your mesh will come into play when you're using the dynamics too. So you wanna make sure that you have, you know, pretty clean surfaces on your models. So this was a good way to get that base start. I just took that alpha, generated the topology of it, constricted it, and now I got a good start for this mesh. But now I wanna go through and just polish it up a little bit more. So I'm coming down the deformation slider here. I'm gonna polish by features, usually once or twice, which is gonna nice, go through and soften up those edges on that cloth there. And then I'm gonna to go to the geometry area and go to the Z remesher. And I'm just gonna give me new topology with Z remesher as well. So now I've just come through and let me make sure I delete my hidden. Now I've gone through and just Z remeshed that model. Now at this stage, I have a mesh that's set up and ready to go for this cloth simulation. So I can go through and use these dynamics now and tailor this. Now, before I go further into this, I'm gonna activate dynamic, which is gonna give me that smooth kind of preview of it. I'm also turn on solo so you guys can see this, and I'm just gonna adjust the thickness. Now, the thickness comes into play because now I can actually see that cloth with thickness on it, which kind of helps you know bring the design together and makes it a little bit believable. So it's not this single-sided lightweight piece of geometry, but now it has thickness to it. You can change the offset on this if you want. So I want kind of that outer shape to be outer, and then I want everything else kind of pushed back. So I'm gonna change my offset to a negative 100, and that's gonna take now my front shapes on the front, and then it's gonna push all that uh, thickness inside the mesh there. So it's really handy, because now I can get this shirt kind of feeling more like a shirt. Now I can come across the edges now and smooth those out if I need to, but that's all looking pretty decent through there. And now I can start playing with the dynamics. So in our dynamic menu here, I'm gonna adjust some of these sliders uh, over here. So the first thing I want to adjust is the self collision. Now the self collision when you're dealing with wrinkles, um, if you don't have this turned on and you try to do some wrinkled stuff on things, those wrinkles could collide with each other. And it's not going to give you those nice kind of folds that you're looking for because it's just going to go through the mesh. So you want to make sure you have some self collision on your models when you're doing any cloth stuff. And then I'm going to run the constrict here, which is going to get that a little bit closer to the mesh. And you can see it's actually, you know, just enough. It's starting to bring in some more of those forms on the model there. And then what I wanna do is I wanna play with the inflate. 
Now the inflate option is going to extend the model out. So if I have this, this is the same thing that Michael was just showing with that kind of comforter. So it's gonna pop stuff out and pull it out and give you kind of that inflating process. If you're making a balloon, if you're making that kind of bedspread. Well, I don't want the inflate to happen globally. I don't want it to happen in all directions. So I'm gonna limit it down to only happening in the Y direction, which is the vertical axis along the model. So I'm gonna come over here and turn off everything except for Y. Now, when I do this, it's going to inflate the model in this kind of way upward. As you can see, as it's inflating, it's going to look at that topology, and I'm going to start getting these wrinkles generated. So these wrinkles are starting going out. The collision volume is looking at it. And then now I'm getting these nice horizontal wrinkles starting out on my model. And so I can go through the inflate and the contract to kind of bring those in and out. I can also come over here and select that transpose cloth brush. And this will give me that same functionality. So if I come through and now drag up and down, you can see I'm gonna contract that form. This is still using that collision volume. And as I contract this up and down, you can see I'm getting those compression wrinkles. So this is the key thing to get the clothing kind of generated how you want it. You wanna make sure that you're taking things and kind of using it as you would think cloth would be. So compression folds are when two areas are compressing together, right? And then pulling flows will be when one's pulled. So if you gotta, you know, just make sure that you know how the cloth is kind of gonna work when you're actually going through and use it. But the biggest thing with the transpose cloth, and this is the one I kind of use most for a lot of things, is you can run it, and as you do it, it's gonna transpose around that collision. And so I can pull this up or down, I can you know come through and do it, and then if it starts going you know a little bit too much, I can come through and run that contract option again, and it will kind of pull those areas back in together, and now I end up getting that kind of wrinkled shape. Now, once you have this done, you can also use those micro polys too. And this is another thing that's going to give you a different kind of effect on your meshes as well. So these are a lot of fun to play with. Uh, Michael just had a few of these kind of pulled up. Let me make sure I can actually select one here. So I'm going to come through. I'm going to grab, let me find the one I like, this G01. And this is going to be, you know, variable on how much topology your model has. So right now, it's using dynamic. I have a lot of smooth subdivisions applied to this. So if I turn it down, it's going to give me a kind of a lower resolution, but I'm going to be able to see that micro poly there. And I can actually sort through these and see kind of what these kind of look like. So if you're trying to do chain mail, any kind of different things, um, you can get some really cool results with this. And once again, this is all live. So this micro poly here is a live geometry. So this isn't like say nan like isn't like a micro, uh, micro mesh where you have to do it at render time. Um, this is all going to happen on the fly. So if I come through and say grab that cloth hook brush again and start pulling this up and down, you're going to see it's actually going to conform. And so this will allow me to come through and control those wrinkles, pull the mesh out. I can do all sorts of different things with this, and that micro pile is going to be updated. So this has been really fun to play with uh, to get different cloth effects. And I can stretch and pull this. I can contort it, contort it rather and you get some really cool shapes and designs out of it. So it's a lot of fun to do some cloth stuff with. Now, as another example of this, I'm gonna pull up a, another model here. And so here I have a model that I came through and created uh, in the beta here. And so this is uh, Veronica Heather Shields, and she's basically my, uh, my, where my brain goes randomly. So she's thinking of like random superheroes that would be in the 80s. So she wields VHS tapes, uh, why not? Um, and so a lot of her model here was all done with this dynamics. So if I rotate her around, you can just see the amount of madness of these VHS tapes she has on her back. And if you ever grew, if you grew up in the 80s, like I did, the VHS tapes, once you got them on, like spooled out, it was everywhere. And if you couldn't get it back in, it was a mess. So this is kind of kind of the inspiration for this model here. And you can just see like her back is just an entire mess of uh, VHS tape tangles. And so something like this, I wouldn't have been able to do at all or even probably attempted to do uh, before these dynamic options in here because it's just chaos. And you need kind of that chaos and that dynamic control in order to get anything kind of function like this. So before I get into that, to show you guys how I kind of did those, I want to hit on quickly just some more of that micro poly stuff really quick. So I'm gonna come and start turning off some of her objects here. And I just wanna show some other ways uh, that we're using the micro poly stuff. So all her clothing uh, is basically, you know, that same kind of thin process started with the thing and then just applied some of those dynamics to it. I have, you know, a dynamic option here turned on. And if I come through and select my micro poly, 
You can see just how much of a change I've gotten. So there was nothing there, and now I have this design. Now, this is a uh, truche pattern. And so this pattern is really cool with the micropoly stuff because it, if it randomly aligns anywhere, it gives you a different kind of pattern. Um, and it always is coherent. So this means you can turn these shapes you know, everywhere else and you're gonna get a different shape or form out of it. So her kind of gown and clothing, I made these little custom micro polys to kind of mimic this result. Once again, this is all live. So if I came through and let me just turn off um, and recalculate collision belly here and come through and actually you know, manipulate this on the fly and it's all gonna change and distort uh, all the way through a mesh. And so a lot of these pieces all have that kind of micro poly asset kind of built in. So it keeps the model light and then also adds a fair amount of detail. So her leggings and her skirt was all doing that. Another thing that was really cool with the micro poly itself, it's creating things like jewelry. So here I just have a simple real thin band, right? So this is just standard band, nothing exciting. However, if I activate that dynamic and then turn on a micro poly, I can sit something like these little spheres here and now she's instantly got jewels, right? And this is still, you know, controlled by the cloth stuff, so I can move this around. Now decorator jewelry, do all sorts of stuff. And this is all just using this dynamic. So it just took that boring, you know, single polygon piece of geometry there, added another element to it, and then with the dynamic on top of it, I now have a totally different effect happening. So really fun to play with those parts. Now for the hair, what I did for this was I was going through and, you know, doing some crazy experiments. And basically, I made a little curl thing here. And if I select this curl, and this is just a single-sided insert mesh. And then I took this insert mesh and I just started populating in her head. You know, basically how you do it if you're in special effects, where you're going through and you're feeding each of the individual hairs with a pin through the entire model. So <clears throat> with this, I came through and just started doing that for the entire head there. And then I used the dynamics with this to give that a little bit of thickness. And then I came up here and I started messing with these dynamics. So I'm gonna update a few of these settings over here. So I got my collision volume and turn on gravity, set this to say 10. We're gonna zoom her out a little bit here. And then now we're going to activate this. And you're gonna see as this simulation runs, it's gonna go through and take all these little curls here. Let me turn down my rate here for a second. I had too many, too many iterations. The stream, the stream has taken over my computer. We may just keep going. <laughs> and so now you got craziness, right? Let me, let me adjust this one more time here and turn off that self collision. There we go. And so as you can see, it's going across the entire model. It's conforming, it's hitting that collision volume and now it's generating all these curls off of there. So I ran this a few times on the different things there. You can see kind of the chaos mess. And then I went through and used that kind of snake hook. So this is still live. And now I can brush it back from her hair, right? Move this around and it can form these out. And then I ran a few of these across her to get those kind of dynamic results. So really cool stuff, just thinking of it in different ways in which you can use these dynamics to create all sorts of different effects. Now, another thing with the dynamics is that I had all these little VHS tapes all over the place, right? So she had VHS tapes everywhere. And then with these, I have these kind of strands of tape, right? So with these, you know, same thing I can do with these. If I just run normal gravity on this and I just put, say, like liquefy on, you can see it's gonna go through the floor. If I turn my floor collision on, you can see it's gonna come down like that. I can adjust my gravity a little bit. You're saying deflate all these things. So all these little extra pieces were done in the same way. I just took that one coiled piece of geometry and then had it so it deflated or used the collision volume to get that result. Now these are climbing upward. So for this, what I did is you just reposition your model and then there's a set direction button over here. And what this is gonna do, whatever is model is, whatever your model is facing, whatever the down part is, the lower part of your screen, that's where the gravity is gonna go. So the gravity is always gonna be down at the bottom of your screen. So I flip the model on its head, and now if I do set direction, this is now the ground. So now if I come across and say protect just the bottom part of that one there and run the simulation, you see it's gonna grow upward. And so that's how I got these kind of 
floating bits of tape from the other area. Now, correspondingly, I come and grab these. I can then set the direction to be the opposites and then run that simulation again. And you can see now they're all going to fall. And what's really interesting is they're going to collide over whatever the you know, simulation collision object I had. So now she's actually caught it in her hand. So a lot of cool stuff you can do where you can just deform, change your meshes, and a lot of uh, potential for happy accidents, all sorts of stuff. And <laughs> that's how I kind of ended up with the uh, crazy VHS tape girl here. So I'm going to drink water here quick, and then we're going to move on to some more, more dynamics. So I'm kind of paying attention to uh, messages. So Pavlovich is, I think, is uh, keeping it going for me. All right. So that was two little demonstrations for like cloth stuff, right? So using dynamics, we had the initial basics, we had the uh, clothing stuff, and then now we're going to get even some more craziness. So here, I have a little scene, another little scene that I made here, and here we got a truck and we got a tree. <laughs> they both begin with T. So I don't, I don't know. All right. So let's say we got this truck here. And I got this tree. So I'm going to come over here, and I'm just going to create some uh, collision volumes on this. We're going to turn off our gravity over here. Make sure we got my liquify off, too. And we're now just going to take this truck, and let's see what happens when I move it into the tree using the transpose cloth brush. So I'm going to take this and drag this out. And see, it's going, 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 going. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> so not only can you take you know, the cloth stuff on things and use them for clothing, but you can also use them for other things, like doing stuff like this. So now I've had this kind of crash this truck into that tree there. I can now, say, go back to my normal transpose and move it back. You can see this is the, the damage I got on that tree there. Now, when the tree got hit, there was also some other things that probably happened, right? So the tree you know, was here. And then it probably, you know, would have fallen on the truck like this, right? Like after it was hit, you know, of course the tree's going to fall, right? So I've just come through and kind of moved the tree like that. But then, of course, when it falls, right, it's going to dent the truck some more. So let's go back to my truck. I'm just going to move it back a little bit from the tree and a little bit below it. And now I'm going to activate that transpose cloth brush again. And I'm just going to move it up into that tree. Actually, let me calculate my collision volume. And as you can see, as it's going up, we're going to get a little more damage to that truck there. And then if I turn on that floor collision back on, let's deflate those tires a little bit too, right? So we, we, got, we got a little bit of damage, ran into that tree. The tree's now falling on us. We've got the dented hood on top now. Um, it's, it's, it's a big mess through here. And then we can adjust that tree just one more. Let's pull it just a little bit out of the top of that car there. So there we go. And then of course, after the tree, you know, got hit, got damaged, well, it's it's not alive anymore because it's been taken out, right? So what happens when you know trees aren't alive, right? So let's recalculate this. Let's do some uh, some gravity. Let's turn on liquefy. And then let's run that. Oh, no, you're not supposed to see that yet. Hold on. Hold on. Let's select the leaves. And now let's run the simulation on that. Now we have all these leaves falling off the tree. So a lot of different things you can do with dynamic. And if I had my floor collision on, we would actually go to the floor as well. So now you can come through. You can set up your whole scene, get these you know, dynamics propagating. Now I have the leaves falling on the car. I've got the leaves falling on the ground. If I had a higher gravity on this, it would go a little bit faster. So I just have it a little bit low right now. But you can see now I've got that scene populated with those effects. So a lot of crazy things you can do with this. And then if you're getting really crazy too, you can actually go and even do the tree as well. So this tree is just a simple tree that has some nano mesh applied to it. And I can come over here, recalculate the collision on that, and then use that liquefier. I'm gonna change my gravity to five this time and start that simulation. And now I can even take that tree and just turn it into you know a big messy mesh of tree there. So even for organic, for creatures, for simulation, um, all sorts of cool stuff you can do with these new dynamics. So that one was a fun one to do. <laughs> All sorts of stuff. All right, so now I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Michael again, and he's gonna show you another kind of version of a truck that looks a whole lot better than the one um, <laughs> I just destroyed there. And you can see some more 
information on this? So my technology, not quite as advanced as Drust. We're, uh, we're in the more of the 1950s land. Um, but it's going to be kind of similar. But what I did is I took a kind of a different approach as opposed to, uh, you know, I can run Dynamics on what I see here. But I can also use Transpose Master to kind of send me out to a dumbed down version or a low res kind of everything combined version. I can just run the simulation on that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I want to show you that all of this stuff is just smoke and mirrors. It's all just dynamic preview. This is very simple geometry here. If I go back into the dynamic subdivision and I turn that back on, you're going to see the thickness and the smoothness and all of that stuff is just preview meshes. Um, and even this is actually, I had an even lower res uh, version of this where, you know, I had a bunch of array mesh. Uh, you can actually have very, very low uh, resolution files. Like I can have this entire truck sit on like 10 meg worth of geometry just using all the cool tricks that ZBrush has available. Um, so, but what I can do is I can run a simulation on the low res version and then bump it back up uh, to this version over here. So what I'm gonna do is move that down so I'm not distracted by your guys' comments. And then we're gonna go over here to um, Dynamics and I'm also gonna go in here to my Z plugin. And again, this is just a truck sitting here. Everything's just kind of smoke and mirrors and uh, it actually has a lower res version of it. So I'm gonna go over here to Transpose Master. I'm gonna say T-Pose Mesh. And that's going to take all of my subtools here and give me one mesh that I can run simulations on. Of course, I need something to run a simulation on. So I'm gonna go through here and I'm gonna append a cylinder. And let's go in here to W and scooch this down. Make sure I'm BTR. So I'm not in the cloth transpose. I just want a regular transpose for this. And we're going to go ahead and scale this down. And we'll give my truck something to run into. So we have this ready to go. And we also have a floor collision if I want. So I can have my truck selected. And we can go over here to our dynamics. And you know we do have gravity. I'm going to turn that gravity down a bit. And we have floor collision on. So if I want kind of popped tires, I can uh, run the simulation and just have it kind of squish down. And actually, let's take that firmness down a little bit so we can get a little bit more of a kind of a squish going. And also, uh, if I want to you know, have it run into this tree, I can have it, I can have gravity do it for me, or I can use my transpose cloth. So I'll have gravity do it first. We'll go ahead and set that gravity in this direction. So now I can uh, crank up that strength and just run that simulation and burp, burp, burp. of course first thing we can do is collision volume so that now when we run it uh, it'll go ahead and collide with that mesh now you have a lot of control over how your mesh reacts and when it reacts so if i go up here to like firmness of four or five and run it i'm going to get a very let's speed this up a little bit i'm going to get a very different reaction as it hits uh you know as these things kind of bounce around and move around than if I have it on like say one or two. Another thing I can do, if I go in here to brush transpose cloth, I can go through here and I can, now I can control. Now I'm in control, so I can go through here and I can make it bunch up here. And then I can literally individually go in here by visibility and say, you know what? Drop that firmness down a little bit, say firmness of one and hit W and kind of move this in and maybe crumple it at a firmness of one, bring everything else back, you know, maybe change my firmness again. Um, I can also start turning on self collision at this point. now. There's a lot of things sitting on top on top of each other, so self collision is going to cause it to kind of, you know, react against each other. Um, but again, you know, run the simulation with self collision on, and now things will start bouncing off of each other um, as it's careening through this uh, this poor file. So again, you can also go through here. Uh, you can change the angle. You know, maybe you screeching in from the side. No. Uh, and then, you know, that's where we can stop. And this is where uh, we can send it back. Um, another thing we can do, I don't know if we'll get real deep into it today, but when I go to send this back, you're going to notice that there's a transpose mesh to layer. So as I send these back, I can have that layer information so I can have, use a slider to dial it back to its original form. So that's kind of cool as well as speaking of layers. Down here in 2021, you can see a new option called uh, record deformation animation, and that's going to record to an MDD file. So you can actually record any vert changes happening uh, on your mesh, and then you can save it and you can replay it back in ZBrush using movie timeline here. You can just kind of play it through your timeline, um, or you can export it as an MDD file. And if you have a program that can use MDD files, you can take that vertex animation and apply it there. Uh, and but you know, just like uh, Joseph did, I can take this collision volume now and I can reposition it. Oops, let's BTR that one. So I can take this collision volume now and I can do a recalc because I've moved it. And then I can say in W, 
and maybe sma oh, B T C sorry cloth transpose so I can kind of bust this up even more and then now when I take it back let's go ahead and say delete this here and again this is just the low resolution nothing meshes but when I send this back over to transpose to sub t now my ones with all the fancy dynamic uh, properties and all the all the settings that I've applied to it are now going to be updated in here. And now on this mesh, I can apply those subdivisions. I can go in here with my cloth brushes and bang it up and all that stuff. Um, go. I'm going to go a little off script here just because uh, there's there's other movies I did read in the. I am. You know what? I don't even have that on. I do have. Um, you know, movies on all of these, most of the things I'm doing here. So we can actually go through and, you know, you can see how I did smoke and how I did the wires and how I did the shattered glass and stuff like that and all that good stuff. Um, and in fact, here's the final, final image of that. And the, uh, the backside here, you're going to see these little canisters here kind of dented and kind of broken up and stuff like that. So just really quickly, um, just to again, show you how easy it is. Let's go out of here. And let's go into it. Eh, just grab a cylinder. Who cares? Make poly mesh 3D. And we're going to say uh, poly group, poly loop here. And let's make that a little more obvious. And let's make it so you can see it a little bit better. There we go. It's here, here, here. And then Q mesh, uh, poly group all. Pop this out. And you know what? Let's also grab a little insert uh, multiple edge loops here and just tap here. So now we've got a little barrel. I'm gonna go in here to geometry, dynamic, uh, smooth two is fine. So now we have a little barrel we can uh, put into our scene. So I'm gonna take my uh, truck here and let's switch back here. And I'm gonna say subtool append. And we're just gonna grab that cylinder here and we'll get hit a quick BTR. And so now we have a truck filled with you know, little barrels. Now, of course, when these barrels and you have a collision and things start smashing around, um, you know, this thing's gonna get kind of dented up a little bit. So again, all we gotta do is go in here and say uh, collision volume. Let's go ahead and just recalculate that collision volume. It's calculating everything in my scene as a collision volume now. So now when I go to BTC, which is our cloth transpose, I can take this and I can run over the side. It's like, oh, boing, hit the side and then it flip. And then we still have floor uh, simulation on, so it's gonna bah, oop, hit the floor. Um, oh, it's way down there. Oh, I, my, my pole's far down there, but bah, hit the floor. And again, you can always change the firmness here if you want you know, a little bit more reaction. And don't feel like, okay, I have to do everything with dynamics and then I'm done. Remember, you can always use any cloth brushes, any you know pinch or, sculpting or clay brush or whatever you need to do to kind of go through and sell it. But you can also see how easy it is just to kind of tell a story of a barrel bouncing off a truck there. So that was my version of a, a car wreck. And again, great minds think alike. Uh, but it's also thinking of dynamic simulation applied to everything you can do in ZBrush. The cloth, absolutely, totally cool, love it. It does us so much other things that, um, you know, I, I feel like we're just scratching the surface. I feel like you guys are going to get a hold of this and blow all of our minds with all the cool little things you're going to think of uh, that you can use dynamics with uh, with a ZBrush functionality. So now, so you know, we did that one, and I also did as kind of a demo. Again, just kind of thinking of cloth and physics and dynamics and stuff. How to kind of maybe make a basketball shot scene like this. So let's walk through that a little bit. I'm going to say delete all. And let's go in here. I'm just gonna, you know what? Here's another macro. Uh, so I can go through here and I can change this poly mesh 3D. And underneath macros, there is a uh, delete unselected tools. So now I can go through here and just delete everything out of my scene except for my selected. So that's a cool one. So now let's go in here to our, well, let me load up a tool real quick. There we go. So you got a basketball net. And how I basically went about this, and again, if you know me, I'm going to have deep dives on all of these things. If you want to see, um, there's going to be a video on this show on the time lapse and all that good stuff. But uh, for now, just kind of breaking down a few things that were run on this. If I go here to my uh, poly mesh cylinder here and say, oops, looks like I may have ruined this version here. Let's see, dynamic, micro poly off. You know what? I may have to recreate this, but it's not a huge deal because it's pretty easy. So 
No biggie. I'm going to go up here and we have our hoop and I'm going to use that as size reference here. And I'm going to go in here to texture import, and we're going to grab our side view texture at a spotlight. So I'm just going to use this as a reference because, you know, while I'm modeling the stuff, I want it to be vaguely generally accurate. And uh, we're going to go through here. We're going to say, you know what, let's duplicate this off. And I'm going to hit uh, M. W and I'm just going to grab a quick cylinder 12 here and unify what let's do this so basically what I'm looking to do is unify and there you go so insert cylinder here. So basically I want to recreate this net and I'm going to use micro poly for it. And I'm going to use this cylinder to kind of get the, the right size that I want. So again, B T R to go back to regular old transpose. Let's turn our poly frame so we can see what we're doing. And we're going to drop this down a little bit. So here we go. We basically have our net here and I'm just going to go through here with a slice curve and we're going to slice through here. And then I'm going to go through here and say insert multiple edge loops. We're just going to pull that up so that we can get uh, in individual um, divisions in here. Actually, before I do that, let's go ahead and scale this in and scale this in Get that. And when we do that, insert multiple edge loops, let's turn on interactive elevation so we can actually squeeze this in a little bit as we're adding those divisions. So now we have our net here. And you can see how easy that was. Let's switch back over here and say delete hidden and delete hidden. So now we have basically what our net needs to be. And now I need to replace it. So I went in here to geometry and then I went in here to dynamic and let's turn smooth subdivs down to zero. And they did have a micro poly that was pretty close. It was this vortex over here. So you're going to see uh, with vortex selected, uh, it actually has thickness. If you ever want to check these things out, just go in here and hold down alt and tap. And in fact, let me alt tap this weave color over here too, because you're going to see weave color actually has four variations on it and it has poly paint on it. So you can actually go through and start poly painting on your mic micro poly meshes and you can have variations between them. So instead of having one thing repeated over and over again, you can have a bunch of variations repeated over. So it kind of breaks up that um, illusion. And then also you can have poly paint applied. So when you go and paint, it'll multiply uh, that color to it. So it just allows it a more natural look. Um, but what I was looking for here is this vortex. So you're gonna see this vortex actually has thickness already built in. I don't have to do dynamic thickness. You can create things that have thickness in micro poly and apply it to your mesh. And you get some very, very cool results with that. Um, in fact, I like to just go like make a shape like a star and just go through micro poly and just see what all the little different things do. I mean, it's astounding. And you can also create your own, which is what we're gonna do. So anyway, uh, I do want to go ahead and say, um, let me go ahead and apply this. So we have the micro poly here. So now we have real geometry. And let's, again, so you can see it a little bit better. I'm going to go through here and I'm going to say bridge two holes. We're going to bridge this top one here to this one. So we can kind of loop uh, this over. And then again, down here on the bottom, you can use this to kind of loop between, you know, this one here and this one here. You can kind of just pull that out. And now you can loop those together. And the end result of that is just this net, essentially. Now. You may be thinking, oh, great, looks just like the net I want. However, uh, why it's not the net you want is it's dynamic. So these threads, the way that MicroPoly was put together, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just uh, for my purposes, um, what's going to happen is when I, you know, okay, I'm going to mask this out, and I want to go through and you know, B T, uh, oops. E C K for cloth uh, jet. Oh, and another thing too, cloth also works in um, radial symmetry. So you can go through here and do all sorts of zany stuff. Um, however, what I'm really getting at is here when you go into gravity and run simulation here, um, let's go ahead and reset my direction there. Um, so now uh, none of the knots stay knotted because they weren't knots to begin with. It's only doing what you tell it to do. Um, so that didn't quite work, although I could get it to kind of work. Uh, what I ended up doing is saying, okay, I need to make a custom one. Now I tried to make one with knots in it, but again, knots want to untangle uh, when you're in dynamic simulations. And you can mask, but you, when you mask something, you can't dynamically move it. So I kind of had to think, um, a, a little bit beyond just base functionality and kind of try to stack some ZBrush functionality to get what I wanted. 
So let's go ahead and duplicate this off. We'll make a quick custom one. Let me go down here to initialize a uh, Q grid. You know what? Let's make this a six. Q grid here. And uh, what we want to do is make sure that this is inside a square. If we go in here to our uh, floor, and you're going to see this fits inside one unit. We go in here to draw and say, drop this grid size down to one. You're going to see here's that grid sitting and it's just one unit square. So that's what it's expecting. Uh, however, when I go and rotate this 45 degrees, now I'm outside of that unit square, but I still need to make some more changes to this. So we're going to say from move points, we're going to say delete a point here, and here, and here. Oops. Still too big. Well, I can go, well, let me use my not my custom menu. If you guys, you know, ZBrush is very, very customizable. Uh, customize the interface to how you want. You can see mine's changed a little bit and I'm constantly over here in my custom menu. I'm um, just a little pop-up key. Just make your own custom menu, assign a hotkey to it. You're good to go. Super easy, really fast to do. But um, underneath deformation here, I'm gonna go hit unify. And now it's fit perfectly within that uh, plane here. I don't need this original uh, vortex anymore. So now I got a vortex one. Now I can go through here and I can, you know what, I don't, I'm making a net, so I don't need all this. And here's another 2021 option. You can also hold down alt and you can unpaint very easily uh, go through here and paint and unpaint uh, your selections. So we'll go ahead and take this one here and say delete hidden. And then now I'm also gonna make these poly groups here. So isolate this, control W. Now we have a new micro poly, go back here, go back to our original here, if I can find it. Sorry, I'm uh, frazzled. Let's uh, undo back to where we had just our, there we go. This here, and then uh, micro poly is on. And I want to control click our new geometry. So now at this point, uh, it's just a preview of it. So I can still go in here to brush, transpose, cloth, or B, let's see, Q, and then uh, brush, cloth hook, go through here, and we can simulate this around, even if it's not real geometry. Uh, so we can do that. And if we want a collision volume two, it might make sense to have a ball kind of telling part of that story of how, why and how that cloth is moving. So let's go out of solo mode here. With uh, the net selected, we can go through here and we can say, okay, give me a recalculate that collision volume with the ball showing. And now when we go through here and we say, uh, I guess if we just run the simulation, um, it's going to kind of fall around the ball. Of course, we need to mask these top parts here. But I also need a little more geometry, I think. So I'm going to go through here, and I'm going to say, you know what? Give me thickness. And if I do thickness this early, it's going to give me extra geometry up here. If I turn my micro poly off, you can see I get these edge borders, which micro poly wants to draw on. So I can't do thickness just yet. What I can do is a, it's order of operations. I can say no thickness, but go ahead and apply the uh, micro poly. Boom. Now give me more dynamic, turn micro poly off. You can stack micro poly and get the fractal thing like we talked about earlier. Um, but now that I have that as real geometry, now give me thickness. And now, uh, there we go. So now we have a net that we can kind of use to go through here. And we can say, you know what, let me mask this top part here. And we can go through here and say, uh, run the simulation. It'll kind of run around the ball. And of course, you know, maybe you don't want gravity on if you're going to be pulling this around, or if you do want gravity on, maybe crank that firmness up. So now B, T, oops, not B, C, K, you go through here and we can kind of, you know, it, it interacts with your collision volume now. Uh, and of course you can go through here and you can do, uh, let's see, turn on our smoothness, smooth subdivs on here, and you can start getting kind of that net result. Now you may be thinking that's great, but what about the knots? So all of these poly groups I have in here, I have it set up here so I can turn this off. So I basically uh, use those poly groups to put in poly planes. And this is where we're going to transition into nano mesh functionality. And there's so many cool things you can do with nano mesh. But one of them is, uh, you know, these polygons through here, if I, uh, you know, I basically took all those corner uh, poly groups that I had that were blue, and then I applied a knot to it. And what I can do with that here, if you guys can see that, uh, so we have nano mesh. So we have nano mesh on here, and uh, I have, if I do show placement, you're going to see really it's just them sitting on those blue uh, poly group planes, and they're being replaced with these little knot uh, things. So if I go out of here and I do turn off show placement, I can go through here and I can do like rotation to make sure they rotate the right way. I can set their alignment. I can put in a little rotation variants so they're not all the exact same, make it look a little more realistic, um, all that stuff. And I can go in here to edit mesh. And it's like, you know what? 
art director said, I need to go in here and in all their wisdom, I need to go through and I need to bevel this edge loop here. And I, you know what else they want? They decided they also want to um, Q mesh polygroup ball. Actually, let's do an extrude polygroup ball. And then we'll say, just push this in. And when I go out of edit mesh, everything's been updated. Or uh, if I go into edit mesh here, I can also, um, let's go into brush, insert, uh, industrial parts here, and I can just swap this thing out. So if I was like, you know what? Um, our director wants to get a little surreal. So we're gonna go and grab a Phillips uh, screwdriver head here and then go out of edit mesh. And now they've all been updated to um, screws. You know, really, really deep, really makes you think. So that's kind of the power of nano mesh. And just to kind of, let's hop out of this real quick. And just to kind of show you a little bit more, just to kind of, again, delve into the world of nano mesh a little bit more. I'm gonna make a poly mesh 3D here. We're gonna go to geometry. I'm gonna reconstruct down something reasonable, hit delete higher. And so if I wanna use these as insert mesh brushes, I can, I can just go in here and insert mesh brush. But if I wanna create a nano mesh brush, all I gotta do is go up here to brush with this one selected and say, create. Nano mesh brush. So now I can hover over this and I can insert a nano mesh brush or say polygroup all. And now we're on here or no, not on there. And then we can go through here and we can say move this around. And these are just instances sitting on the faces of those planes. So we're familiar and you, you could run simulations on this, but if you're going to do that, you know, also consider using micro poly because you can kind of get the same result. Uh, it's a little more flexible for, uh, you know, dynamic surfaces. But as far as nano mesh functionality is concerned, another cool thing too, sorry, I'm, you know, I always, I just tell myself, you're not going to go on tangents. It's going to be a long, long stream, uh, but I, I got to bring it up. So over here underneath nano mesh, there's also, um, you can do like H and V tiles. So we can say like four and four, you can do different patterns. So if you want to do, I just put it in the corners. You can put all your nano meshes in the corners. You can put it along the borders here. So many cool things. You can change the size as you go. You can go through here. And again, you can do little offsets and rotation uh, variants so they're not all the same. And this is actually how I ended up making the, uh, in that scene here, all these little lights back here are just scattered nano mesh little spotlights that I added. So anyway, now we know, now we're all nano mesh experts. So let's take that one more level here. And I'm gonna see if I can see this here. Details. Let's bring in our, our real bad driver. And uh, we're gonna use another ZBrush 2021 functionality of um, nano mesh I think you guys are really gonna like. Um, there's kind of three ways you could do this. Actually, there's probably a zillion ways you could do this, but there's one that's going to be in the documentation. And then I'm going to show you two more ways that you can do it uh, in here that I think you'll get a kick out of. So uh, in here, I have a, a farmer and inside I have a little uh, a star. Number one, it catches the name. And number two, it allows me to kind of work on subdivision surfaces. So I'm going to go to BTO for my topology brush. And we're going to go in here and I'm going to make some shoulder pads for this guy. So we're going to do... Uh, here's where you can see I don't, I can't draw a straight line to save my laugh. There we go. So uh, we have this on here. I can hold down Alt and I can tap on here and I have new geometry. I can, and it's still stuck to my star here. So I'm going to go ahead and just do a um, split mass points. Of course, that's underneath your subtool uh, split menu there. So I have this shoulder pad. Now, the problem is if I want to work on this symmetrically, if I want to be like, well, I can work, I can kind of go through here and I can do like, okay, uh, turn on local symmetry and then say uh, mirror and weld in the Z direction. And I can kind of work symmetrically here, but the shoulder pad, sometimes, you know, it kind of sits kind of maybe back into the side, or if I want to do an elbow pad, um, like, so uh, that's sure not going to work. There's, there's no axis of symmetry that's going to allow me to work. And let's also be VTR. There we go. Oh, so, you know, that's just, that is not going to happen. There we go. Um, so how do we how do we fix that with this new ZBrush 2020, 2021 functionality? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to say, you know what, I'm gonna work on the shoulder pad. I'm gonna go into deformation down here and unify it. I'm just gonna throw it right in the middle of my scene here. And I'm gonna turn on my floor so we can kind of see that axis center and we can go, you know what? Okay, fine. Give me a quick uh, mirror and weld across the X axis this time, small X, there we go. 
Uh, so now I've got this, and I can go through here and I can start modeling. Let's go extrude polygroup all and hold down shift. We can pull along these surface normals uh, to go through and start doing our shoulder pad. And you know what? I can go through here and I say crease level of two, smooth subdiv of three, and I get a nice shape. And you know what? Let's go ahead and apply that and dynamesh this. And now we're off to the races. So now we can go through here and we can start sculpting our shoulder pad. However, well, how, how am I supposed to know what this is going to look like on a shoulder? I can guess and hope, uh, or I can do this. So two ways. Number one, uh, you can, you can uh, you know, we have Xmature on here. Yeah, yeah, we can use that. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, BI brush insert, and there's an H, uh, primitives H in here, and there's a new single poly in here. So I'm going to put on his shoulders where I want the shoulder pad to go. And we're just going to put this here. Again, it's kind of stuck there. So I'm do your whole uh, split to unmasked points here. And now I want to put this object onto those polygons. Pretty easy. Brush, create insert mesh new. And we want to do a nano mesh brush. So again, brush, create insert nano mesh brush. It's also an option in here as well. So now we have that and we have our planes here. So we don't need this one anymore. Uh, so now we have this one, we can just draw it out on these planes. So I'm gonna go through here and there's our shoulder pad on that plane. Now we're gonna go down here to our nano mesh properties. I'm gonna do zero rotation at negative 90. And I'll go, oh no, this one's not. Turn off X symmetry, go into your Z modeler brush, BZM, go in here to spin edges and just go, bang, bang, bang. There you go. So now uh, we're looking good. Uh, if, so the show placement is just to show you, hey, this isn't real geometry, you're not sculpting on this geo but you are manipulating this plane, which is driving the location and size and everything about uh, this nano mesh or uh, yeah, this nano mesh mesh. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn off show placement and we're just gonna like kind of treat this, turn on X symmetry. We're gonna treat this as like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna put the shoulder pad where it is. Doesn't, I don't really care about axis symmetry. I just need to put it where it needs to go. And I think that's just about right. So now when I wanna edit this mesh, go into edit mesh, and now you're gonna see it's automatically gonna go into a split screen mode, which is now new in nano mesh here. It used to be, I mean, it still is underneath transform split screen, but now it's automatic uh, when you go through here. So now we have X symmetry turned on. We're gonna hit, uh, go in here to our trim, dynamic and go through here and let's give it a you know standard brush here let's turn off lazy mouse here we'll put in cool this is where i'm really going to slow the stream down and do just a beautiful um crazy awesome uh, skull sculpt right not but that's all you're getting sorry about that so there's our here's our shoulder pad and then over here you can see boom it's updating um and there's again uh, almost anything you can do in ZBrush, you can do to the setup mesh, uh, just like we showed you before. But you know, you know, I'm gonna add horns to this thing. There is nothing cooler on the planet than dragon bone horns. So I'm just gonna go in here and we're just gonna hit uh, M and say grab these horns. Now, if I do horns like this, I can see immediately I'm gonna start running into some problems. You know, he he's gonna be real careful with that head turn. So now that I can see both of that, I can go. You know what? Let's help him out a little bit and the animators, so they don't yell at us, uh, and the rigging department, and uh, the concept artist. Everybody's gonna yell at you, but uh, if you do this, now you're kinda cooking with Crisco. You can control drag, and now you got uh, a cool little um, shoulder pad thing. And again, while you're in here too, let's say, you know, go into um, reset this, sorry, and then we can go through here and say, uh, you know, bend arc. We can go through here, and if you want to bend it around that shoulder pad a little bit more, we can kind of bend it here, and then we can change this radius down so it's a little bit tighter. So you can see it's updating over here. Uh, if your if your system's running a little bit slow, or you're working on like a 10 million polygon mesh for some reason, or you have a ton of instances at a million polygons each, you can turn off show instances and then just start sculpting. Uh, let's turn on X symmetry here, and then uh, it should update uh, just fine. And then then when you want to see it, just turn on show instances and you're good to go. So that's one way. Now that's just to kind of get you again, we've learned the basics of nano mesh. Then we went down, uh, okay, here's how you can kind of manually set it up. Here's a cool macro. I think just Drust wrote it. So uh, kudos to him. Always, always give shout out to Drust when I can. Um, how we're gonna do the exact same method with one button push. So once you're familiar with nano mesh and how it works, I'm gonna go through here and I'm gonna say, let's delete this out here. So we're gonna go back to our original um, thing and we'll go back here to split screen off. So we have this shoulder pad and we wanna put it on our guy. And this is again, 
erase everything out of your head. This isn't a continuation of that. We're starting fresh, we're starting new. This is gonna be much faster. So we're gonna go into our macros in 2021. And there is a uh, create instant subtool. So make sure your camera is snapped to the front here. Say create instant subtool. It's gonna run some operations here and it's gonna tell you, okay, drag this thing around and control drag if you wanna copy, no problemo. So I'm gonna turn off our original here and I'm gonna say, okay, Acro told me to go through here and just position this mesh. So this is now just a shoulder pad I'm gonna put in my scene. Uh, and in fact, you know what? Let's take this and hold down control and just drag off a copy. I wanna have, he's gonna be all padded out. So we're gonna do some elbow pads here and control drag out here. And we're gonna rotate this one around. Then we got some knee pads. So now uh, we're good to go. Now we do have, uh, if we go down here to nano mesh, uh, that macro has done all the work for us. So if we do uh, show instances, or I'm sorry, show placement, those are the little uh, planes that are driving this interaction. And if I want to, uh, again, I can just do a quick mirror and weld, put it on this side and then do a quick uh, spin edges, uh, spin edges, single poly, have off, no masking, and two, three, and there we go. So now uh, we're all set up. And now if I wanna go in and edit these meshes, just one more time, let's show, turn off show placement, go into edit mesh. And now we can go through here and um, brush snake hook, maybe go in here with a Sculptors Pro and go through and oops. ES snake hook, where are you at? H, BSH, sorry. Uh, you can turn on Sculptors Pro in here and all of these things updating on the fly and uh, everybody's having a good time. So now here's one thing to, to keep in mind, and it's an easy fix. If let's say, you know what? I want those knee pads to be a little bit smaller. Those aren't really working for me. So I'm gonna go out of edit mesh mode. And if I go through here and I try to do a, uh, let's see, show placement here. And I'm like, okay, let me scale these down and go through here and scale them. Um, oh, you know what? Did I have, oh, I had fit turned on. So, <laughs> When I did this previously, proportional was the default, fit is now the default, and it's even better because uh, what that's going to allow me to do is move these things around and put these right on the knees here and I can move, scale, and rotate them. So I can use the same edit mesh instance, but now I can go through here and kind of fine tune uh, the placement of these. And again, I don't even have to show placement. I, I do just to kind of show you like how this is all working under the hood. Um, let's turn on LSIM so we can look just go along that local axis there. But again, super easy. Uh, and if you want to get rid of some, it's like, yeah, those little pads ain't working for me. Just delete the plane. Geometry modified topology, delete hidden, turn off show placement. And you're good to go. And I think that's it. Drust? Yeah, looks good. <laughs> that makes sense, everybody. <laughs> <clears throat> We had some we had some comments that we're in a, a newly painted apartment is where we're <laughs> Yeah, we're beige land. Real really pink guys, <laughs> me and Drust. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we had a lot of questions about when this is coming out. I, I don't know if we, we may tell you here in a minute. Um, I got we got a few more things I want to show you quick um, that we've added. Uh, so some of these things have been the ones that you guys have been kind of looking for for a while. So we're gonna hit on those and then maybe, maybe. Well I'll, I'll, I have to converse with Michael a little bit more to see if we're actually gonna <laughs> let you know when this when this is coming out. We'll see. We get Kyle here. All right. So since we had that, you know, basketball goal going up, we, you needed some sort of shoes here. So these are little low tops um, there. So we had a little object here that was just quickly uh, done. And one of the new things that uh, we've kind of added, we've added two things into the. Uh, Z modeler brush and the uh, first one that I've been using a lot of um, is some new additions for extruding edges. So for the first example I want you guys to show you guys here today is I just have this shoe here and a lot of you guys if you're doing games or different things you're going to probably come by and you know do some recapo at some point. Um, it's just you're it's going to happen. Um, so with this uh, I've just taken say that um, Insert I'm in Primitive H brush and use that little single poly option there. And I've just drawn out a single primitive here. So I have my shoe. I'm going to just turn off those extra ones here for speed purposes. And now I just have this little poly here. Now with this poly, if I select the Z modeler brush 
you know, I could come through and use the additional Zmaller functionality, which is insert edge loops, Q mesh polys, move points. And what we've done, we've added some additional functionality. So the first thing we've added here is if I hover over an edge and go to spacebar to go in the Zmaller edge action menu, in here we have an extrude function now. And this is going to allow you to extrude edges. So if I come across any edges, this is an open edge. You can see it's you know it's single sided here, and click and drag, I'm gonna be able to extrude this out. And there's a lot of different functionalities and things for this that will allow you to keep extruding and snapping edges and grow out all different stuff. So you can pretty much create from scratch, if you would like, just using edge extrudes now. And there's a bunch of different functionality in there, works with symmetry, does all sorts of stuff. So with this edge extrusion process, the one thing it's really, that I find it really useful for is retopology. And with retopology, you can take your high-res ZBrush model, you're still in ZBrush, you can pen this plane object and then start using this to your advantage. Now, one thing when extruding single edges, if I start rotating my model around, you're gonna see that I'm gonna start kind of losing it, right? And this is because those points aren't really being rendered inside ZBrush, it's rendering the polys and the edges. And as I rotate, you know, you may end up losing it to the side there. So one thing that's really nice with this extruding engine is that addition of that dynamic thickness. So I can go down here to the geometry tab now, I can go to that dynamic subdivision area, I can uh, enable dynamic, and then set my smooth subdivision down to zero, so it's just going to be my pure polygon there, and then now I can adjust the thickness. And this is going to allow me to see now that single-sided piece of geometry with thickness. And you wouldn't believe how many things you can make with just the thickness. Like you can start extruding stuff out. So if I come across that edge and keep doing this, now it's giving me that Q mesh effect. However, this is all dynamic. So if I turn that off, this is what I have. I still have that single-sided geometry. So if you're making any thin parts or anything that's, you know, has this weird contours of shapes, if you did it with thickness before, saying using Q-Mesh, and you wanted to change something, it may have been hard because you may would have had the, to go back in and clean up those undersided areas where that thickness was already generated. With this option now and the dynamic thickness, you can now just model how you'd want to model, and if you want to make a change, you can delete that face, delete that edge, and then it's going to go right back to that single-sided piece of geometry. So it's been a huge kind of game changer in terms of uh, building stuff, and definitely retopology, uh, anything that you have inside of ZBrush. Now for a retopology example, I'm just gonna show you guys how I set up a Zmaller brush to use this. I'm not gonna go through and retopologize this entire shoe, but I wanna show some examples of this, just show you how it can fit into your workflows you already have. So the first thing I do is with my Zmaller brush selected, I've just you know appended that plane, added thickness to it, and now I'm gonna change a few settings on the brush here. So I went over that edge, and I went to that edge action menu. I made sure I had that extrude option set, and then down here in modifiers, we have a ton of different modifiers that allow you just to change how these extrusions will happen. So you can do it by edge loop, you can do it by selected loops. There's a whole bunch of different stuff. So this is all gonna be in the uh, documentation when it comes out on how to use all these. And I'm sure we'll get some videos from Michael as well <laughs> covering all these features on his YouTube channel. So with this, the main thing I wanna hit on here is the snap to surface. And so we can now edge extrude and have this snap to the surface of the model. So now, depending on what my angle is, if I drag this out, you can see it's gonna to snap to that surface. So it's snapping to the surface of that shoe. Now, in addition to that edge extrude with the snap, if I hover over a point, this is gonna bring up that point action menu, and in here there's the move, and we have our normal target, which is brush radius, and then down here we also now have a snap to surface. So now you can snap that edge extrude, which you didn't have before, to the surface, and you can also snap the point to the surface. And then finally, for my poly action, I'm just gonna set this to do nothing. So now I have my poly set to do nothing, my edge is set to extrude, and my point is set to snap to surface. So now I can come across my model and click and drag, and this is gonna snap those polys right to the surface. So as I'm moving it, it's gonna snap down, I can now extrude these out. The extrude is smart, so as you get close to an edge, it's going to try to latch on to an existing point. So you can actually use this and start building your topology really quick. And so as I come around the edges here, you can see I'm just extruding these out. I'm using the move points to snap it to those areas. Then I can continue dragging, moving, dragging, and moving. Now, one thing with the snap to point is that it will also perform a weld when it happens. So if I generate something like this, and now I take this point and move it to that other point, it's gonna now snap to it. And this is now going to weld. So this is now a welded point. So I've now cleaned up that topology there. 
and took those two points together and welded them. Now you're gonna have to retain those kind of quads and triangle processes as you do this. So it's not gonna allow you to click, create end gons, um, but you can use that to now retopology your meshes. Now another fun one is as I'm moving these out to kind of fill in this different part of the shoe here, is that let's say you have a long strip of geometry too. So let's say I wanna run this across here. So I wanna extrude this out and then extrude, 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 and have all those edges in there. So I can go back to that edge action menu, and in here we have an option for number of rows. And what this will allow you to do is when you're performing this extrude, it's going to add divisions. And if you have that snap turned on, all these points in the division are going to snap along that surface. So you can see as I drew this out, each of these points on those edges are snapping along the surface there. And this can even go back around you know, the back of the shoe here, and you can see it's all going along that curvature. So this has been a really easy way to come through and start retopologizing different objects. And especially after you've created them, ran some dynamics on them, maybe you just wanna get them a little bit lightweight, you can use these new options with the Z-Modeler brush. Now, another thing that we added in here as well, let me just hop into the finished kind of topology shoe here. So this was the kind of finished version of that. And I can come in and just finish this off really quick by just, let me turn off my number rows there. Snap that one, snap that one. And then we can get this one to snap. So there's my topologized shoe. Is that, as Michael hit on, we added that kind of option to clear your polygrouping. So if you hold down Alt, and let me get a uh, turn into the shoe mesh option here. And so if I came through and started polygrouping and then I accidentally polygrouped something I didn't want, if I come over and hold Alt and click, it's now gonna revert back to that original polygroup. This is a huge time saver, especially if you've gone through and set up a whole bunch of different polygroups for different like edging and creasing and just accidentally went through one time and just tagged it with that alternate polygroup. Um, now you can actually come through and remove those and get it back to that initial polygroup you had. Now, another thing we've added um, is a equal distance. And so if I come through and start dragging my geometry out and maybe select these polygons here. And now come across this poly and go into the poly action menu. In here, we have a inset option. And in here, we can come through and now use this. And there's a new modifier called equal distance. And what this is gonna allow you to do is as you use this, it's gonna give you an equal distant offset. Now you have some options you can change this to. So there's a snap variation down here. And this will allow you to come through and generate an equal distant offsets on any selections of polygons you have. Now, one thing that's different versus this and other equal distance stuff is that it's gonna try to keep the curvature that you had initially. And so if I come across you know, the side of the shoe here and now use this, it's gonna try to keep that same curvature. Now you could go through and select the option to the standard one, and this is kind of what you're kind of used to, but you can see as you do this, it's gonna change your kind of topology. So the equal distance is gonna allow you to try to keep that kind of conformed or um, smoothness you had on your mesh as you insert those polys there. And this is why you'll get some triangles in time because it's trying to calculate that thing. So another little addition there to the Z modeler brush as well. So we've got the edge extrusions, we've got the equal distance and then the clearing or the point snap and then the clearing of the poly groups if you accidentally have put one of those temporary white poly, poly groups on top of them. Now, what else do we have here? Let me look at my list here. So one more thing, uh, well, actually two more. So we've done a, uh, a lot of speed stuff, so I'm gonna get Kyle to start queuing up that thing there to show you guys quick. And we've also added the, oh, Kyle's on it. <laughs> so we've added a bunch of uh, speed improvements. And so if you've used 2020.1.4, uh, this version is a lot faster. Um, and just some of the examples we have here in terms of the things with the move brush and also the Dynamesh, it is lightning fast now. Um, so these processes, some of these Boolean objects I was creating in 2020.1.4, when I went to Dynamesh, it would take a while. Now they're instantaneous. And the same thing with the move brush. So we've done a lot of speed enhancements, a lot of performance enhancements. So if you had anything that was, you know, working with large files and large scenes, it's gonna be a lot faster now. So we've, we've done a whole bunch of stuff just in terms of speed, speed and improvement. So really awesome stuff there. And then finally, um, I'm not sure if it's faster than Pavlovich. Now Pavlovich is pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs>
So finally, we also, in this version, have added the ability to use the image 3D file format. So if you guys have used our free version, ZBrush Core Mini, um, if you have anyone that wants to get into digital sculpting, we do have a free version of ZBrush, which is called ZBrush Core Mini. You can download this for free, and it'll allow you to use some of these sculpting brushes in there to create assets. One of the things that ZBrush Core Mini introduced was the ability to save out these image 3D files. And so these files, let me just see if I can tab here quickly and show you guys these, are that these files are saved as your standard image files. So what I have here are just GIF or GIF images, and these files contain model data. So with ZBrush Core Mini, we introduced this file format so you could save it out, and this way you can get a preview of what's in your file. So instead of just having an extension with a little icon of ZBrush on it, now you can actually have these files, and it will show you what was on your screen when you saved this file out. So these are some of the ones that we used in the examples today. And you can see these are pretty big as well, so the file size on these can be very large, but it will generate them in these GIF or GIF image formats. You can also do them as PNGs, and it's just your standard image file, but these image files now contain this mesh data. So these can now be loaded into this version of ZBrush as well. So if you have created anything inside of ZBrush Core Mini and you would like to now sculpt on these, let me actually go to my correct directory here where these are. I can now grab these and open them up. They're gonna load right in and now I can use those. And these will load any of those files in, so if they're created in ZBrush Core Mini, these were created in this version, and so now I can load that up, and there's my whole pool scene there, and it's just pulling all that model data from those images. All right, so that's the end of the stuff that I have to show, but we do have one thing that you all have been going nuts about, and I mean, through the entire chat, I, I was thinking about, you know, telling you Early on, like in the few minutes, I, 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 I'm over here like, well, should we tell them now? Should we tell them later? Um, when is this coming out? And when will I be able to you know, get my hands on this and try these dynamics? So the version, this version of ZBrush 2021, let me get, let me get a little, my little web page up here, will be available tomorrow. So it'll be available tomorrow at August 12th. And we're shooting for a release time of 11 a.m. PST, so that is LA time, and that will be tomorrow the 12th. Now, once again, if you already have a license of ZBrush, this will be a free upgrade. So free upgrade tomorrow, August 12th, and we're shooting for 11 a.m. PST. Now, once again, if you do not currently own ZBrush, you can definitely go purchase ZBrush now, get your license information all set up with my licenses, and then tomorrow, when we go live with this release, you just need to take that information, plug it into the My Licenses page, and then download the latest version. Now, where you can go to get the information on when this is released, we will be posting it on ZBrush Central. So if you just go to zbrushcentral.com, there should be a nice banner up here. So this is like the sneak peek peak one that we have right here. And you can take this and then in here we'll have the information on how to perform that upgrade or purchase a new license of ZBrush. So definitely the upgrade is free from your current license of ZBrush to 2021 and it doesn't matter when you purchased your license. So if you have a really old license of ZBrush, this upgrade is still free from that version. Uh, you just need to have your My Licenses login information and then log in and download it. So tomorrow, August 12th, at around 11 o'clock PST, which is LA time, we're gonna try to, we're shooting for that time there, and that's when it will be out. So Michael, do you have anything else to add? I wanna thank uh, you for coming out. No, uh, thanks Thanks for letting me uh, <laughs> go try and uh, do some ZBrush live. That's a, it's always nerve wracking, but I, I hopefully it all made sense. Um, I would only say, we've only scratched the surface. Like when you start thinking of dynamic surfaces and collision surfaces, I'm gonna drop some videos on YouTube now that are just the time-lapse things and you'll be able to see it on the website um, where you can use topology to take topology and snap it into another thing. You can use cloth brush to move topology in other places. So again, let your brains go wild. Think about all the weird things and awesome things you could do in ZBrush and apply this technology to that'll just 
you know, do amazing things. I, I'm, I can't wait to see what you guys do. Yeah, and the, the videos Michael's talking about too, we're also gonna throw up them on ZBrush Central as well. So you'd be able to go to ZBrush Central and see those. Um, I had one more thing I wanted to say. I can't remember it now. Tangents, tangents. But thank you, uh, Michael, for coming and helping me with the stream today. Um, wanted to, you know, but we're doing all these ZBrush masters and bringing in these other artists. And we thought it would be a great time to do that. Bring Michael in since he was doing some really amazing stuff in the beta and have us have him help us out um, with showing you all these new features. So I think that is it. So tomorrow, just log into ZBrush Central. You get all the information on there. We'll be, after the stream, also we'll be putting some additional videos from Michael on ZBrush Central as well. We can go and watch those and see the different things that he was experimenting with in the beta. Um, if you're looking for anyone or know anyone that is looking for something to try uh, and they want to get into the world of digital sculpting, definitely uh, go and have them grab ZBrush Core Mini. You can just go to ZBrush Core dot com slash mini and they can download zbrush core mini for free um, it's great for learning zbrush getting into digital sculpting uh, schools anything so if you ever just want to have someone experience zbrush for the first time uh, definitely try it out and i'm looking forward to see what all you do with this new version and these dynamics and definitely if you do anything really cool post one zebra central we'd love to see them and i think that is it so very cool yeah, thank you all for coming out, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> Take care. Stay safe.